The final major objective for my remaining time on Monarch is to deal with Monarch Stellar Industries and the Iconoclasts. Remember, their constant bickering is making it impossible for Hiram to maintain steady communication with his off-world contacts and secure the chemicals for Phineas. I head back to the ship to brainstorm, but when I get on board, Ada informs me. Crew members Ellie and Max are engaged in a heated discussion in the kitchen. Normally, I'm too busy to see what's up every time Ada brings these occurrences to my attention, but I'm curious about this heated discussion, so I go upstairs to see what's up. Max. Maximilian. Vicar. Vicky. What? Shoot, I forgot. It'll come to me. It occurred to me. I may be powerless to stop my own crew from antagonizing each other, but I'll be damned if I let a handful of corporate stooges and ramshackle rebels stand in the way of my mission. In the interest of time, I'd much rather gun down both sides and move on, but I'm going to attempt to put my trigger-happy tendencies aside and try my best to prevent an all-out war between the two factions. I have yet to really get acquainted with the Iconoclast, so once I'm good and ready, I head to Amber Heights. Fallbrook is the closest landing pad, so I step off the ship to get going, only to turn around and go back on board because I forgot to save. I'm saving at this particular time because I have a feeling that coordinating a negotiation between the two factions will put me at greater risk of making mistakes. Not just any mistakes, but mistakes that may bar my progress towards my goal and require me to load a previous save in order to fix. Now that I'm good and ready, I run over to Amber Heights and have a look around. My engineering and science skills are finally up to snuff, so I head over to the work orders terminal that I found back when I was here talking to Agnes's little boy, Tucker. I am not a little boy. I'm able to successfully handle two out of the three work orders. Once my hacking skill has reached 55, I'll have to come back here to finish up. That was a hard day's work as far as I'm concerned, so I mosey on over to the bar to chat up the only guy that doesn't look like a copy and paste NPC, Ash. Never seen you before. I buy him a drink, and he regales me with an anecdote about the hot pole, which, surprisingly, is not the name of the local strip club. It's not a particularly interesting or funny story, so it doesn't merit repeating. I exit the bar and make my way up towards the back to speak to the Iconoclast leader, Graham Bryant, who is currently speaking with Zora Blackwood, most likely his second in command. I've been traipsing around this law forsaken planet for far too long, so I skip the idle chatter and get straight to the point, telling Graham to stop clogging up the airwaves. Stop? No. Spreading the truth is the only way to combat the board's poisonous campaign of propaganda against their people. I use my science skill to assert that his broadcasts are barely reaching even a handful of people, and then Zora suggests he shifts his focus from spreading the word to the survival of his followers, since they are in dire need of basic supplies like food, ammo, and medicine. Like people tend to do, Graham doubles down in his futile pursuits by tasking me with salvaging and repairing a printing press that he's had his eye on for quite some time. If I help him with that, he promises to cease communications, and that's the end result I'm after, so I accept. Wonderful. He says he ordered replacement rollers for the press a while back, and Huxley was supposed to deliver them. Speaking of which, where is Huxley? Huh? Hello? Hello? I hear boots out there. Wait, can Raps wear boots? Since Huxley is their supply runner and she's still recovering from her ordeal, Graham sends me to Bayside Ruins to meet with the MSI agent responsible for smuggling goods to them, Carlotta. Lastly, Graham wants me to spend the last of what little money the Iconoclasts have left on high-capacity cartridges for the printing press job, while Zora, the more sensible one, wants those bits to secure supplies for the people. Obviously, I'm going to help her. I take my leave and head out for Bayside Ruins. On approach to the ruins, some shady character named Niles is positioned firmly at the front gate. Hey, I know you. Boss says you've been real helpful, like. Judging by his attire and the full contingent of sublight thugs walking around behind him, I can hazard a guess who he works for. I tell him I'll handle this and make sure he gets the credit. He mentions that I should see to the generator and then takes the thugs and leaves. I head into the maintenance building to check the generator and it requires my hacking skill to be 55, so now that's two hacking related jobs I've got to do when I next level up. I walk over to the main building and buzz the intercom to let Carlotta know the coast is clear to open up. I don't know how you got those goons to leave, but thank you. Graham ordered rollers and whatsits, right? For a printing press? Here, take them. Carlotta says that support for these supply trades is being pulled and this is the last time she'll be helping the Iconoclast. She says Graham's account has some bits left in it, so I ask her for the supplies that Zora mentioned needing. Now that the deal is done, 
I noticed this place was a literal supply room, so I looted it top to bottom and then left to head back to Amber Heights. I enter Graham's place and hear him and Zora engaged in yet another debate concerning the best use of time and resources. This time around, the resources are the Van Noys, experienced iconoclast field operatives who get shit done. I interrupt to tell Graham I secured the rollers and use the remaining balance for food and medicine. Thank the Eternal that someone's got some sense in their head. Carlotta usually schedules the next drop during the meeting. When's she coming? She isn't. That is most unfortunate. Graham sets that matter to the side and wants to focus even more on getting the iconoclast message to the people. That said, Zora is able to infer what happened with the Van Noys. Graham sent them and a few others to scout out Terra One publications and secure the printing press, instead of sending them to some ruins to assist Zora's team in a confrontation of some kind probably with Marauders, where Iconoclasts ended up dying. Seems to me like he could have worried about the printer after backing up Zora's team. Yes, you're damn right he could have, but he's so obsessed with preaching that he's become blind to our actual problems. Zora tasks me with saving the Van Noys, so I get going. Terra One Publications is in the northern half of the Monarch Wilderness, meaning I would get there faster if I fast travel back to the ship and dock us in Stellar Bay. So I do that, take a nap, and head out. I loaded my medical inhaler with suitable food and drink, so now I can eat and drink on the go. Since lives hang in the balance and it's very easy for NPCs to bite it during a gunfight, I save my game before exiting the ship, preparing for the worst case scenario. I take the lift down from the landing pad, continue the time-honored tradition of ignoring Grimm, and rush through the northern gate. Since I've got a fuckload of light ammo and a bullet hose for a gun, I have some fun spraying down the dozens of Raptodons between Stellar Bay and Terra One. Before I know it, I reach the Van Noy team and talk to Mae Van Noy. Hope you're here to help. We only got so many bullets left and I ain't keen on using one on you. I tell her Zora sent me to find them, Mae says her crew is worse for wear, and their medic has a trauma kit that they need in order to get patched up and make the trip back to Amber Heights. The problem is that they got separated from some of their crew, including the medic. So someone has to find the crew and the medic, and that someone is obviously me. I take the stealth approach to plasma snipe the patrolling raptodons before moving on around to the side buildings to hose down the rest of the opposition. It's just so satisfying to do. After the coast is clear, I find the medic and pry the trauma kit from her cold dead hands. I give the kit to Mae Van Noy, let her know she can now only refer to the medic in the past tense, and she says the crew will move out after they get patched up. I hit level 20, dump my skill points into hacking, and unlock the cheetah perk, which increases my running speed by 20% effectively making me fast as fuck boy now for the other reason i'm here the printing press inside terra one publications right when i enter the building it's obvious from the pings on my compass and the dismembered bodies strewn about that i am not alone i loot what i can and then take a look through a window at what i'm up against more raptodons i could pop open the bulkhead doors here but there's a smaller door to the right that leads to a hallway which surprise surprise has even more raptodons in it i guess it's time to fire up the doom soundtrack One of the boss raptodons almost got me when he lunged at me from like 30 feet away. That one hit took half my health, and that's as close to death as I want to get for today. I continue looking around, coming across a few terminals detailing how the employees are dying, but the board refused to do anything about it. Nothing special. Eventually, I find the main terminal, run a diagnostic to confirm that it's the rollers that need changing, and then initiate the swap. With the printing press now operational, it's time to bolt. I take a look down the hill to make sure the Van Noy's team got out okay, and start to fast travel back to the ship, but with my improved running speed thanks to the cheetah perk, I opt for a cross country spent back to Amber Heights. I had to dodge a group of enemies here and there, and at one point I slipped and fell into a sulfur pit, but I made it back in one piece. I get back to Graham's place, and for once, him and Zora aren't bickering. I was about to talk to Graham, but remembered I have that final task on the work orders terminal that I can do now, so I head over there and complete that and then go see Graham. If you'll just listen- No, no more listening, no more preaching. We are losing people left and right. We need to act. Zora is obviously fed up with Graham being an idiot, and that makes two of us. She asks about the Van Noys, and I let her know they're safe and on their way back. I let Graham know the printing press is functional, and he says he will cease using Devil's Peak Station for his messages. That's one faction dealt with. Zora says she wants to talk about something, and I should go see her in the clinic. I'll do that, but first I'm going to go fast as fuck to the other hacking related task I have yet to complete. 
fixing the generator for sublight over at Bayside Ruins. I pull up my Naki socks and take off, this time avoiding the sulfur pits and make it there in record time. I head right for the generator, fix it, and vent the gas, whatever that means. I go to walk out and the air is filled with toxic gas that nearly kills me, marking my second near death of the day. That's when I remember what this function is for. If I was not keen on helping Niles and the sublight thugs, I could have snuck in, fixed the generator, and vented the gas, killing everyone present at the ruins. Lucky for sublight, I'm not siding with the board in this playthrough. With that mystery solved, I head back to the clinic in Amber Heights to talk to Zora. She asks if I know the real story of what happened in Amber Heights. Obviously, I don't, since, thankfully, I don't live in this hellhole. Years ago, almost a decade come to think of it, the executives running MSI lived here. If you can believe it, Amber Heights was a residence for decadent high-class types. When the other corporations started pulling out, the planet was chaotic. People got lost in the shuffle, a lot of equipment failures, a lot of death. Pirates ransacked Amber Heights, killed the execs, their families, took off with whatever they could carry. We're talking a hundred innocent people. Nobody ever found the pirates, but Zora thinks the nearby relay station was their recon point. One of her people found an old data cartridge in a raptodon nest that happened to contain two codes. One being the code to the Amber Height front gates, and the other code being unrecognizable, but she guesses it goes to a door of some kind. Zora realizes it's a long shot, but wants me to head to the station and look around for any clues or evidence that may have been left behind. I could use the extra XP, so I accept and head out immediately. The quest marker puts the station a short jog away, so I pull out my LMG and get to stepping. I reach the destroyed bridge that Catherine's guy was ambushed at, and realize I never spoke to the NPC on the other side, so I head over. Once I reach his side, there's a mob of mantisaurs between us, so I remedy the situation and then speak to him. Name's Weston. Every once in a while, I set up a shop along these here roads. You find yourself in need of resupply, you come on by. Since he has wares, and I have bits, I take a look. Unfortunately, he only has things I can either get for free or I already own plenty of, so I move on to the relay station. Since the station grounds are indeed crawling with mantisaurs, I wait for the coast to be clear, hop the fence, and then gain entry to the main building using the security code Zora gave me. There are lootable crates throughout the room, so I get started on those and, almost immediately, find an old data cartridge. In the far corner of the room is a surprisingly pristine dead body, which is odd considering the last human activity this place saw was a decade ago, but I digress. Since this guy doesn't need it, I take his eye patch. Might need to cosplay as a pirate at some point, who knows. Before I skedaddle, I have a look at the communications terminal for anything interesting. The first thing that fits this description is a manual log entry at the bottom of the list. According to the entry, someone named Bryant hired thugs to ransack Amber Heights, promising them an insane amount of bits. But the residents didn't have bits, only possessions that would be near impossible to trade or fence for a worthwhile price. After the chaos, the group of thugs scattered, with some of them ending up here in the relay station, only the station had a failsafe to lock itself in case of forced entry, so the thugs tried ripping off the wall panels to find a way out, only to die from starvation. Sucks to suck, but let's circle back. The name Bryant sounds familiar, as in Graham Bryant, and I don't think that's coincidence. On my way out of the building, I clear the grounds of mantisaurs, just because I have the ammo to spend. With my bloodlust temporarily sated, I need to get back to Amber Heights to share what I've found with Zora. The fastest way to do that would be to fast travel back to the ship and take us to the Fallbrook landing pad. With all the shit moving I'm doing just to save time, it's gotta look confusing to the townsfolk. Just imagine a plane flying low, darting back and forth over only your neighborhood multiple times a day as if someone's using it like an Uber. I take the opportunity to sleep and refuel before heading back out to Amber Heights. Once there, I make a beeline towards the clinic to share my findings with Zora, and she pieces together the same story we do about Graham. Looks like correspondences between the pirates. Some bits here, some there, some... Wait. This... This one's got the Amber Heights gate code on it. Just like the one I found earlier. And here's... A letter. Wait, this is from Graham. Oh, of all the... Captain. He gave them the gate codes. Zora says she needs some time to process what she's learned, and I take my leave. Since the Iconoclasts are over and done with for the time being, I head back to the ship and float over to Stellar Bay to kick Monarch Stellar Industries off the Devil's Peak signal. Once I head down off the landing pad, I head straight for the MSI offices to, begrudgingly, speak to Sanjar. And by speak, I mean demand that MSI stop broadcasting immediately. 
You're just as rigid as the old executive committee. Why, we've hardly been able to get a clear message out until recently. When Graham finally shut up. Sandra says it's hard to keep a corporation afloat without the board's backing and he needs to signal to communicate with MSI's trading partners. As far as a more permanent solution, Sanjar has been concocting a plan to get MSI reinstated to the board. The plan is two-pronged, as he puts it. The first step is ensuring Stellar Bay is properly defended. Monarch does seem to have a bit of a Raptodon problem. And a Mantisaur problem. And a Marauder problem. Sanjar says these problems can all be solved with a Bolt 52 cartridge. He doesn't go into detail as far as what a Bolt 52 cartridge even is, but lucky for him, I already have one with me. It was stashed in the same abandoned MSI storage facility that Huxley was locked in, and my sticky fingers must have nabbed it without me even noticing. Either way, that's less footwork I have to do right now, so I hand the cartridge over. This thing that's going to solve MSI's problems is a bill of liquidation and transfer form number 52. Basically, it'll legally protect MSI's financial assets on Monarch once Sanjar makes his move against the board. If you didn't follow that, it boils down to corporate espionage. How was that, Celia? Did I sell it? Your best delivery yet, sir. The second step to expedite Sanjar's rejoining of the board involved another corporation. He believes another of the corporations is operating illegally somewhere on Monarch and wants me to find out the who's, the what's, the where's, and the house. His only lead is that Catherine must be supplying them out of Fallbrook. Lucky for him, I found the proof he needs. Already? Yes, already. This is news to me too, so I had to back up and think for a second. Remember the destroyed bridge where Catherine's transport was ambushed and her man Arthur fled underground? Arthur informed us the attackers must have came from somewhere up the hill, and I was convinced I'd never find where the hell that was, but I already had. The facility I came across with the two scientists tied up on the roof was somewhere up the hill, and that place is a secret facility run by Universal Defense Logistics. <laughs> if only the rest of the colony operated as efficiently as you. If only. I toss him a cartridge with the UDL data on it, and he now has all he needs to resubmit MSI to the board. That means no more broadcasts from us. Now that all that is over, I hit level 21 and round out my lockpick, medical, and persuasion skills because I don't know what else to raise. Next, we head back to the ship. Ada informs me of a disturbance, so since I have a second, I head to the cargo area and see Nyoka teaching Parvati some tips on weapon handling. You're adjusting before you pull. You're anticipating. You... Of course I'm anticipating it. What if I shoot a friend on accident? That's on account of your stance. You want to lean into it. Embrace it. Work with it. I leave them to it and have Ada set us down in Fallbrook because it's time, once again, to hoof it all the way up to Devil's Peak Station and see Hiram. To save time, bullets, and unfortunate deaths, any mob of enemies directly in my way on my route up to the station were dealt with in three easy steps. Enter TTD, shoot each enemy in the face once to inflict blindness, and then continue running. By the time blindness wears off, I'm long gone and the enemies don't give chase. I make it to Devil's Peak Station, head inside, and go talk to Hiram. Do you hear that? It's the blessed sound of radio silence, which leads me to believe you have sweet, sweet news for me. I confirm that MSI and the Iconoclasts are no longer transmitting and ask him if Phineas's data is ready. Hiram tells me that his contract with Phineas stipulates that any acquired trade information is to be relayed to the purchaser and only to the purchaser, which is fine by me. I just want to get the hell off this rock. To send the data, Hiram needs me to help him cycle the antenna's receiver to accept some necessary adjustments. I bet I have a bunch more shit to do now, don't I? Oh, don't be ridiculous. We're resetting a broadcast tower, not filing taxes. There are no errands, spreadsheets, or rituals involved. Except it needs three keys to activate and I have to go find them, right? Eternal no. What is wrong with you? Who would ever design something like that? Now that we're done with the fourth wall breaks, all Hiram needs me to do is step outside, flip a switch, and fuck off. My kind of quest. I step outside, flip the switch, and Devil's Peak Station is now fully operational and... Oh, uh, that's not good. and we were so close to leaving. Black holes, did you see that? Sanjar chimes in, and then so does Graham. The ball of fire that used to be the ship isn't even extinguished yet, and they're already arguing over who gets the salvage. The most important bit being the gunship's targeting module. 
All one of them would have to do is salvage the weapons, apply the module, and they'll have the leg up on any would-be aggressors. I won't pick either side, but I will go grab that module before either of them can get their hands on it. Listen, I don't care a single whit what you do, so long as you leave me out of it. The ship crashed in the northern section of the Monarch Wilderness, just up the road from that side's half of Rizzo's Cascadia, so I get back to the ship and set us down at the Cascadia landing pad. I get there pretty quickly because I am speed and head inside the ship through what used to be the cockpit window. I'm disappointed the dead heavy troopers don't have armor to loot, so I take the lighter set to give to Ellie later since she's still wearing plain clothing. All that's here is a locked door and a terminal, so I have to look at the terminal. The captain's command key card, which is what I need to access the rear of the ship where the targeting module is housed, is currently in the terminal, so that's mine now. Running diagnostics is pointless because, you know. So I start the Mayday message playback. that our captain is a total fucking hull head. I told him again and again that without fixing our regulators, spinning up the engines are going to blow through our coils and we'll go flying off in a completely random direction. Well, here we are. Thinking we'll hit soil in uh, about 30 seconds. This is your chief engineer signing off for what is probably the last time. It's a shame you can't see this middle finger I'm holding up, because I'm doing it as hard as I can. Well, that mystery salt. The back of the ship is a right mess, because, obviously. So I get around the spilled cargo and head up into the back to liberate the targeting module from its surprisingly intact contents. I head back to the ship to think about the next matter. Who gets the targeting module? Graham is a moron, and as we recently figured out, a moron complicit in untold counts of murder, aptly referred to as the Amber Heights Massacre. Sanjar, like every corporate stooge we've encountered so far, is exactly that, a stooge. For entertainment purposes, I want to hear them plead their cases as to why they think they should be the ones to get it, so I head back to Stellar Bay to talk to Sanjar first. The first dialogue option is exactly what I was after, where I ask him if it would be possible to agree to a truce with the Iconoclasts. They're all mad, and what's more, they left us. I don't see any way for us to work together. I bring up his employee review that we found a while back in order to remind him that he alone is not capable of leadership in any capacity. So bringing the Iconoclasts back into the fold would be just what Stellar Bay needs. He asks exactly who among the Iconoclasts would be his partner. The most obvious pick would be someone with leadership skills who thinks logically and doesn't crack under pressure. And we know that isn't Graham. So, Zora. That's an interesting suggestion. Sanjar considers it, but wants to see her employee review. Since 99% of the Iconoclasts are former corporation employees, Zora would have a review. The annoying part is, she was employed by Rizzo's, so her review is in a terminal in the south side of Rizzo's Cascadia. Meaning, I have to head to Fallbrook and leg it down south. The road had maybe one or two enemies since I have been very active as far as killing things. So I waltz into Cascadia, gun down some marauders, enter the office with a terminal, secure a copy of Zora's employee review, loot the place top to bottom, and bolt back to Stellar Bay. Somehow, in the five minutes it took to do all that, someone brought more cows on board. <sighs> I have Ada bring us back to Stellar Bay, and I head to Sanjar to give him Zora's review. We both She's agree that Zora is overqualified, qualified. and Sanjar agrees to bring MSI to the bargaining table. Next, it's back to Amber Heights to follow up with Zora. Once there, I enter Graham's building, and Zora is waiting for me. Captain. We should chat. She has come to terms with the fact that, in order for the Iconoclasts to have any semblance of a future, Graham has gotta go. Zor is ready to take the reins as leader already since most of the people there listen to her as it is. I pledge my support to her and we both march up to Graham to hand him his pink slip. Captain, you must be back with the access codes to our new ship. Graham, we need to talk. I tell Graham it's time to stand down and, rightfully so, he's a bit mad. I built this movement from the ground up. I've brought freedom to Monarch, and all these years later, we're still free. But I know the truth now, Graham. I know what happened in Amber Heights. You didn't start this movement because you wanted to save us. You wanted to save yourself. Graham gets defensive mainly because he thinks just because he caused the deaths of a boatload of people in the past that it can be forgiven and forgotten. Obviously, that ain't a defense at all. I'm sorry. I believed in you once. I did. But it's over. Stand down. I won't. 
What happened back then was a mistake, and the colony has moved on. This is my movement. These are my people. If you want to lead them, you'll have to kill me. And that's all I needed to hear, so I delivered an electric bullet straight through Graham's head. Now that the worst is done, Zora asks if I ever found the targeting module, and I respond by asking if she would agree to a sit down with Sanjar and MSI. As we expected, she's got an open mind, so she accepts and says to meet her at the OSI church. You know, where I found my fancy hat. I head back to the ship, have Ada set us down at Stellar Bay since it's the closest pad to the church, and... You know what? Today's a good day. I think I'll finally talk to Grim. Nah, I changed my mind. I head out to Southgate and mosey up to the front of the church to see MSI and Iconoclast security posted up outside, not arguing or throwing hands. Progress. I enter, and we get the negotiations underway. Sanja, Stellar Bay's got food and walls. And my people need both. If you'll have us, we're willing to share the space. Do you have any idea what that would cost? Why, drawing up the budget alone is going to take weeks. I propose that the Iconoclast soldiers can support Stellar Bay's supply lines against monster or marauder attacks, persuading Zora to have them sleep out in the wild sometimes to free up bed space within Stellar Bay and prevent overcrowding. Truly a compromise? I'm not sure I'd ever have heard as much from Graham. Graham was a murderous fiend, and I'd be shocked if you didn't already know that. As it turns out, Sanjar is possibly more shocked than we were that the Amber Heights massacre was ultimately caused by Graham. Zora is getting worked up about the whole thing, so I urge her to dial it back a bit. Zora and Sanjar reminisce a bit over Graham's better qualities, and eventually the meeting comes to an amicable conclusion. Now hug it out. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'll need to sign a physical contact waiver first. Well, Hiram is back in business, Phineas will get his chemicals, MSI and the Iconoclasts agree to a truce, and war is averted. I'd say I was successful in my endeavors here, so it's time to get the fuck off this rock. You. I'd clap you on the shoulder if I went behind a wall of bulletproof glass. I don't know how you did it. But Hiram Blythe just sent me everything I needed. According to Hiram's message, Minister Clark has ordered us...